uh, soldiers. Um, he shows no sign of ever being anti-Semitic in a meaningful way prior to 1918. That's even true if you go back, go back before 1914. If you read Mein Kampf, there's a, a chilling passage in it where he says, in Vienna, for the first time he saw Jews as they were, and he realised how repellent, uh, how objectionable they were, how disgusting and degraded they were, and he resolved, according to Mein Kampf, to fight against that great internal evil, the bacillus in our midst. There's no external evidence that he ever went, underwent such an experience. He dates, if he writes it in 1924, but there's no corroboration from anywhere else for that um, account. It seems to be made up for propaganda purposes when he wrote it in prison in 1924. So the argument is that prior to 1918-19, he is not notably anti-Semitic. Certainly, given the atmosphere of Vienna, the, the, that, uh, that atmosphere of anti-Semitism, which runs right through from the 19th century, um, he picked up on that, obviously. But he's not specifically, he's not um, spectacularly anti-Semitic. I mean, he dosed down with Jews in Jewish doss houses. He borrowed money. He loaned money to Jews pre-1914. Uh, there's no indication of that deep resentment that deep sense of disgust that he feels that he expresses later. Now, we don't entirely know, of course, the record. Uh, Hitler's career pre-1914 is very sketchy. The work done on it, nearly all the scholars say, there's so much speculation involved in this, we don't really know. And we certainly can't rely on his subsequent, or his later evidence, his later writings. Those, those are distorted. Mein Kampf is a set of distortions. It may contain pointers to the future about how he saw Russia, for example, how he saw the German nation, how he saw the Volk, and so on. But as a, a piece of autobiography, it's very, very deficient. And one now would be very un, uh, unwise to relate any uh, strength attaching to the truth of the story to his account or to the notions we have pre-1918. What happens, therefore, in 1918 is critical, and I'd include really up to 1920. Just trace that through. Between 1918 and 1920, he undergoes some very profound experiences which turn him into a Nazi and which turn him into this great anti-Semite that we identify with later. And the beginnings of that come from, fascinating, come from uh, Russia. Um, when the war ended and he felt betrayed by the stab in the back he was, he was deeply nationalistic by 1918. Uh, that, that, I mean, he, he, he'd embraced the German notion, German culture was superior to all others. Um, he rejected his Austrian Habsburg background and he embraced the, the German notion. So there's a strong element of nationalism. He admired Germany. And most outsiders, of course, have a, have a deeper sense of belonging, like the convert notion. So he felt more German in some ways than many Germans because he adopted Germany. It was, it was his choice to be German rather than Austrian. Uh, that being so, as a nationalist, but an unformed one, I mean, he had a strong German feeling, but it wasn't identifiable, it wasn't programmed. He was very open to suggestion. He's a very susceptible man, I'd suggest, in 1918. And his experience post-1918 is fascinating. Uh, his first major contacts with political thinkers occurs in the University of Munich, where by accident he was sent as, he was sent in the army, he made in the army for 18 months after the war ends, and as an, uh, an observer he was sent to um, <clears throat> survey uh, the parties that might be causing problems, that were potentially dangerous in that very febrile German situation. And he was sent to observe um, this young German workers' party uh, as a soldier, uh, as a part of a surveillance official. Um, but to train him for that, he was sent for sh on a short course to, to Munich University, uh, where he attended lectures on an ad hoc basis. He wouldn't sign in for this, but he turned up at various lectures. He was told, go for this, good, good lecture, good speaker, go, go listen to this. And he heard for the first time a clear analysis of Germany's problems. And the analyses that he heard from the professors who gave these lectures in 1919 was to the effect the great enemy of progress was Jewry, was the Jew as an individual. 
and that Germany had no future unless it came to terms with the enemy within. And that is what he was deeply impressed by. Um, it's a very sudden conversion. I wouldn't say it's a Damascene conversion, but it's pretty quick. It's within a few months. His ill-formed ideas take shape around this notion of the Jew as the enemy. That's intensified by the results of the Versailles Treaty, which of course leave Germany, by German standards, very deeply damaged and punished. And he saw that. He was told that that was part of a Jewish plot, that the Allies were the spokesmen of Jewry. Now, whatever the, the nonsense behind that, he was convinced that Versailles was the exposition of Jewish values being imposed on this defeated nation. Tying in with his interpretation as put to him by these professors of economics and logic, who, who pointed out that financially the whole world was shaped around Jewish machinations, Jewish deals, and Germany was simply the latest in this line of those countries and individuals and populations that were being damaged by this plot. Um, he was introduced to that infamous document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, that, that great white Russian forgery, as you know, um, and he was convinced by it. Goering later said he learned it off by heart. He could quote chunks of the Protocols to anybody prepared to listen. He bought it as a notion. Uh, we now know, of course, it's a total fabrication. But he's, he was sold into the idea this was, this was the Jewish plot at work. And so he ties into his thinking, post-1918, the sense of defeat, the sense of humiliation on the part of his adopted nation. And the explanation is not simply German weakness, although of course he identified weakness with the government, the Weimar government, but principally with the Jewish uh, evil in our midst. And that sets him on a path where the nationalism that he then comes to meet in Bavaria, in southern Germany, it, it then ties in. In uh, the autumn of 1919, he came into contact with a range of white Russian emigres who'd fled from the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and brought them a burning sense of humiliation that they'd suffered at the hands of the Bolsheviks. And they did that elision between Bolshevism and Judaism, that the one and the other were so wedded, were so intermingled, though indistinguishable. Bolshevism was an expression politically of the Jewish plot, the Jewish plan for world domination. So by the end of 1919, he's adopted a set of ideas that came second-hand to him, in a sense, but added, added on to his basic intense German nationalism, give him this Weltanschauung, as he called it, this, this world view, that he then said, all the Nazi writings from then on claim, he was there from the beginning, that as a young man, pre-1914, way up to 1907, his ideas were being formed. They weren't, they weren't. But the notion fitted rather neatly, and it gave it this impression of some sort of development of an individual from a young man to this full-blown Nazi by the middle 20s. In fact, it's a very short... And the, one of the critical factors, which has been overlooked, glossed over, we're now aware of because some of the research has been done, um, in po the post-war period, the notions around Germany, of course, were uh, essentially nationalistic. Whatever form they took, whatever the party forms they took, they were, they were nationalistic. The, the, the identifiable element in all German political parties is nationalism. I'd even say that of things like the Catholic Centre Party. They are very aware of the power and force and drive that attaches to nationalism. And you couldn't run a party, you couldn't develop a party, unless you took into account this basic driving element of German nationalism. He becomes very conscious of this and uh, modifies it in such a way that he turns it into a party program. Once he's again had an extraordinary piece of luck, or fate you might say, where he was sent again as... Uh, surveillance officer, to look at this German Workers' Party, uh, to see what was going on. And rather than just observe, he actually joined in at the question time at the end. He made some very penetrating comments and observations, drawing on what he picked up from the professors of logic and, and history at Munich, but he's very quick to adapt their ideas to this new setting and to turn 